Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be Matthew's chapter 6, verses 5-13. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Sorry, I've got a few extra notes this morning because, uh, well, just because. <laughs> Welcome. This is the moment that I know that, uh, I, I know that you look forward to this like I look forward to it because it has to do with God and it has to do with opening our Bibles. And we can, and you can, open your Bible or look on your phone uh, to Matthew chapter 6. We've been... We've been dwelling here in Matthew chapter 6 for now five weeks, and uh, we're, we're coming to that place where uh, we, we, have, we have enough, how shall we say, we have enough uh, time spent here that uh, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, young, Mr., young Master, Master Flores was able to say the whole Lord's Prayer that we have here in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, by heart. Thank you, Mom. That was a, a dad. That was excellent effort. Uh, uh, we usually don't have a problem saying this prayer. Most of us uh, uh, have some background in uh, education for children, uh, such as what is going on right now. If you're wondering, where are all the young families? Well, I can tell you right now that the, the kids are in good hands with Miss Linda and her team, and they are studying some of the same things, and they are doing service project. By the way, just a, a quick advertisement for what is happening in Children's Church. Uh, they are partnering with College of the Canyons, who have discovered, College of the Canyons has discovered that there are at least a hundred of their students who are homeless. Okay? They're not going to take this lightly, they are doing something about it. And Linda and the, the Children's Church crew are deciding to partner with College of the Canyons to help these individuals be fed. Uh, and that, I think, is a, an amazing concept to teach to our young kids, don't you? Uh, so they have grab bags that they are preparing, which go to the place uh, at College of the Canyons where these individuals who uh, do not have the same food and shelter that we take for granted. I mean, when you woke up this morning, you went, ah, and, you, and you just went off to the bathroom and you did your normal morning routine. Just imagine, you no longer have that house. You wake up uh, uh, somewhere else. I don't know where. And so your morning routine consists of something else. It, 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 it boggles my mind to even think like that. I mean, I love camping. I really do. But uh, it's not the same as when I get up in the morning in my house. So your kids and mine are learning about how they can be of assistance in this town with individuals who are trying to get an education, trying to be good citizens in the United States of America and are homeless. So 
That's where they are. We've been talking, we've been talking about Matthew chapter 6. We've been talking about the Lord's Prayer. And if you may have noticed, the text that gets read in front of each of these has been a little bit more each week. And so this week we come to verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay? This is where it ends. I don't know about you, but I learned, for thine is the kingdom. And I learned the rest of what I thought was in the Lord's Prayer. But in Matthew chapter 6, this is, this is where it ends. I don't know if that is surprising to you. But verse 13 again here says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When we think about temptation, immediately we get cartoon figures in our minds, don't we? On one side of your shoulder is a beautiful little angel in bright colors. And on your other shoulder is another creature that might have different colors and, you know, horns and a tail and, uh, you know, maybe bat wings. Maybe he's black. Maybe he's red. I don't know what color it is in your mind, but this is the cartoon type thing that we think about when we think about evil. Maybe there's another person who comes to mind when I say things like that. I know we're coming up on that season where uh, lots of people love to watch horror movies and maybe you're thinking the evil one looks like a zombie or something else like that. I don't know what comes up in your mind. We have so many pictures, so many ideas of what the evil one looks like or is like. Our special person in our church, we know her as Ellen G., Ellen G. White. She talks about the fact that after the rebellion that Lucifer did change. Lucifer was not as beautiful as he was before. In fact, he turned a reptilian, well-informed opinion about what is going on. I don't know all the details of what is happening in Washington, D.C. right now. I want you to know that this is probably the hardest part of this prayer for me. I have. I have struggled this week in, in trying to think about what would be best to share with you because uh, my tendency is to, to go global, okay? Uh, I, 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 I must confess to you that I, I don't spend a lot of time watching the news, okay? Uh, so maybe I don't have as well a well-informed opinion about what is going on. I don't know all the details of what is happening in Washington, D.C. right now. It's a deliberate choice on my part because I find it so depressing. Okay? And even this morning, as I was talking to one of my friends, she is saying how even in her own family there are people who are no longer talking to each other because they're on one side of an issue or on another side of an issue. When we, when we look at the news today, we can, we can at least agree that we are in very chaotic times. And this chaos is, is threatening on various sides, not just political, but also economic, to, to crash our world. Okay, and when I say our world, I mean Santa Clarita. Okay, that's my world. Okay, and, 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 and this thing that we call life in awesome town, how many of you are long enough in Santa Clarita to know that we call it awesome town? Okay, yes, 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 okay. We have this environment that some of us, and maybe all of us, have worked very hard to create. Or we've been very pleased when we can come and be a part of this town. We can live in Santa Clarita. How lucky for us. Because we are happy that the sheriffs 
keep the chaos down in San Fernando or some other place, all right? It's just not here. We, we don't want it in our backyard. We don't want it here. This is, the, this is the attitude that most of us go to bed with every night. Thank God, you know, when I hear the helicopters going over top, you know, I live next to the wash. Yeah, I, I do. I, I don't live in Valencia. I live in canyon country. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, the wash is right next to me, otherwise known as the Santa Clara River. And yes, every night the sheriffs run that river in their helicopter, and I believe they've got infrared. I believe they know who's sleeping in the wash. They also have uh, people who ride motorcycles in the wash just to make sure that they're keeping track of these individuals. They're not necessarily taking them out of the wash, because where would they put them? This is Santa Clarita every night. So yes, it is awesome to live here. And yes, we do have a good uh, police force and fire department. I do my cycling at LA Fitness and there's the fire guys and I'm going, go guys, go. I'm glad you're healthy. I'm glad, you know, when they leave, I always say, be safe, you know. And some of these, some of these guys drive the hazmat truck, okay, the hazardous materials truck. Now, be safe, guys. You're going out there, and you're going to be doing jobs that, that are very dangerous, but you're doing them to protect us. Thank you. And I say thank you to all of our first responders. I say thank you to our military. I was down in San Diego last uh, uh, Sunday for the Marine Air Show. Got to see the Blue Angels. Got to see the Red Arrows. Got to see the Marines and their big, huge aircraft. Oh, my goodness. America is a superpower. Shock and awe, baby. Oh my goodness. Millions, billions of dollars spent every year to keep the Department of Defense going. You can feel safe. Marines will come to your rescue. I saw them. I saw those, those jets that can hover in the air like this with 30,000 pounds of air pressure going down, holding this huge jet in the air just as still as you like. I saw those helicopters. I saw those Marines roping down from those helicopters. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's also somewhat terrifying to think that that might de be deployed against someone. I wouldn't want to be on the other side. Let me tell you, I'd want to be on our side. So you have this prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What is the evil? That's the question that I have been wrestling with this week. What is the evil that we are asking God to deliver us from? Is it the global system that mangles millions of lives? Is it, like I said to one of the people, I don't know why I said this to this guy in O'Reilly's this week when I was buying a part for my car, are we aware of the international debt that some nations suffer under? Are we aware of efforts to lift those burdens, to forgive those debts? And are we aware of the attitude of maybe our government to not do that? We're talking not just people, we're talking entire nations that will never ever be able to pay back their debt to the International Monetary Fund or the banks or the corporations. Okay? So if you have the misfortune, are you glad to be an American today? If you have the misfortune to be born in one of those countries, your only hope is that you can get to America. 
or that you can get someplace else other than that country because that country is never, ever going to be free. So on one level, I wonder whether or not we can look and be honest today and say that when we pray this prayer, we are actually praying a prayer to say there is systemic evil in this world today. It's part of our global economy. It is not honoring God as much as we would like to think that it is. It is hurting millions, I would, gather, I would guess even billions of people today. My question as a God-fearer of the creator God of the universe is, am I okay with that? Do I even think about it? Does it affect the way that I purchase things? Does it affect the way that I participate in the economy? Or do I just push it out of my mind and say, you know what, I, I'm just going to continue shopping at H&M. Even though the really cheap shirt that I bought there was made by somebody who is being paid very, very little and is living in very, very bad circumstances, might be having to work 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week in order to just put bread on the table. But I'm happy I got a cheap shirt at H&M. That was cool. I don't know if you catch where I'm going because it's tough, right? This is why I'm saying it was hard for me to talk about this because it's me. It's me I'm talking about. And the decisions that I make to participate in an economy that does not have everyone's good in mind. When we are faced with confrontation and chaos, there are two reactions that are told to us that we usually have as, as human beings. When somebody comes up to you and says, you know, they've got a knife in their hand and they say, give me your wallet, you've got two choices, right? You can either fight or you can run. Now, if you don't want to fight, you probably should give them your wallet and then run. Or they're going to run because they're going to want to run off with your wallet. But when we're faced with these kinds of chaotic, uh, difficult things, whatever it is, I just use that as an example, we usually feel we only have two choices. Well, today I'm going to offer you a third because the question that comes up with this particular part of the prayer is, well, pastor, and I'm saying, well, how are we supposed to live in this situation in our world today? How are we supposed to be able to say the 23rd Psalm, verse 4, that says, even though we walk in this valley of the shadow of death, okay, have we been describing the, the shadow of death that is over all of us, and I mean globally? Yes. So as you say that psalm, as you say this prayer, and you're saying, Lord, please lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil, you're talking about the situation of you coming in contact with this, this evil, and, and you're asking God for a way out. How am I supposed to live? How am I supposed to get out of this situation and survive? Okay, the, the psalm says, I will not fear. So you're making a statement there. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to back down. Why? Because you, you have my back, God. You are my leader. You are my shepherd. So he offers us actually a third way. Instead of fight or flight, which are the reactions that the psychologists tell us are human reactions to, to confrontation and chaos and evil coming in contact with us. We either run away or we, we 
want to fight. There's a third way. In fact, uh, there is a, a great book called Jesus and Nonviolence, a third way. Here's how it goes. I'm going to tell you a story. Jesus is teaching, and he mentions that if somebody asks you for your coat, he's, in a, he's talking about an economic situation, and uh, you're very poor, you're very poor, or you have, you have asked for a loan, and you got a loan, and as surety... All that you had was your coat. The law said, now this was the law of Israel at the time of Jesus, the law said that the person who was lending you the money could take your coat, but he had to give it back to you if you were so poor that that's all you had to sleep in as your blanket at night. You had to give the coat back to the person to whom you had lent the money. Maybe you were only lending it for one day. And you took the coat as your surety for the, for the loan. The law said that you had to give the coat back to the poor person so that they would have something to sleep in for that night. Maybe the next morning you took the coat back. And the loan went on. I don't know how it went. But here is what Jesus says. When they ask you for your coat, in other words, you've defaulted on your loan. You could not pay the loan back. So now you are legally bound to give your coat to the lender. You're in court. This is the scene that I want you to see. You're in small claims or maybe big claims court. And you're giving your coat to the lender Jesus says, give him your shirt as well. Okay, so I want you to think of a Middle Eastern man now. He's taken off his coat. He has this long shirt. Okay, so what does he have underneath that shirt? <gasps> Nothing. So are you getting a really strange picture here from what Jesus just said? Here's the court. He's taken off his coat and he's stripped off his shirt. What does he look like? He's naked. How do you think the lender feels at that moment? Jesus says, don't break the law, but show how the law is actually absurd when you take it to its final and logical conclusion. In some respects, Jesus is recommending clowning, we call it today. Some would call it shaming. I'm not necessarily thinking so much of the latter, but clowning or uh, pantomiming or Interesting, interesting word that gets used by the writer, burlesque, is a word that has to do with showing the, the buffoonery of the situation and how crazy it is that this lender is actually asking for the, the coat from this guy who only has a coat and a shirt. That's all he has. And, and, and the law says, you can take my coat, so I'm going to give you my shirt as well. And he walks out of court, a free man, and every jaw is on the floor. And the lender is feeling about this big. Because instead of helping, as the law also says that he should, instead of helping his brother, he has taken from his brother his last coat and now his shirt as well. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray and he says, when you pray, say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. So I'm putting forward the idea today that you may not have associated with this prayer before because it's a very revolutionary prayer. It's a very revolutionary prayer that Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray because you must understand that Jesus is te teaching people in the midst of the Roman occupation, in the midst of some of the highest taxation that these individuals had ever experienced in their lives. It, it, can you imagine? The, they aren't able to pay their taxes, and so now Rome is confiscating their land, and now they have to get jobs uh, tending the vineyards on their own land, and they have to put life and limb together by being hired people on their own land. This is what is happening. These are the people that Jesus is talking to. This is the, the political, social situation in which Jesus says, when you are praying, say to your heavenly Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Aren't you believing that the, 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 the Jewish people in that time, you better because Josephus tells us this is the case, they wanted deliverance from the Romans. When Jesus came over that hill on the donkey and they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord who is going to be the king in David's stead, You've got to know that there's a connection between that event and the fact that on top of Jesus' cross, in three languages, was put Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Come on. Anybody want to be King of the Jews? Come on. This is what we're going to do to you. See this guy? They said he was going to be King of the Jews. Look at him now. We put him on a cross. Uh-huh. You want to be king of the Jews? You'll be next. That was the message of the crucifixion of Jesus in the political arena in which Jesus was operating. So you can imagine now when he is telling his disciples to pray, when you pray, say, Lord, deliver us. Deliver us. You were slaves once in Egypt. You are now in Canaan, the, the land that God has given you, but you're under occupation. And it's painful and it's terrible. The system is evil. It doesn't care about you. So when you pray to your heavenly Father, whom you are asking to be in charge of your life, who you are asking to be a, a king of your world. Say to him, lead us not into temptation. Don't, don't test us beyond what we're able to bear, God. Don't put us in those situations where we're going to have to make such hard choices because, because now we know the system is, is coming at us and it's not our friend. Now we know that we are not going to be able to cooperate with that system the same way that we have been co-op. God, you've just messed up my life. Ever thought about that? That Jesus kind of turned, turned their lives on their heads. Jesus' prayer is an alternate vision of the future. It's a vision that says, if you follow me, if you want to be a follower of mine, then this is the prayer that you will pray. This is the attitude that you will have towards the chaos, towards the evil that is in your world, towards the evil. Here's where it gets very personal for me. I don't know about you, but towards the evil that is lurking in your own heart. The desires that you have to cooperate with the evil that is in the world. Deliver us from this, O oh Lord, is what we are to pray. Because we feel it sucking us in. We feel, us, feel ourselves cooperating with the evil. Sometimes we don't know we are. I call those sins of omission. Sometimes we know we are. Those are sins of commission. 
We are cooperating with the evil. So here in the prayer, Jesus is asking us to, to trust God with our, with our lives. And again, the, the, the piece, I guess, that I'm offering you today is that he presents us with a third way of acting once we accept that we are his followers and we don't want to be wusses and run away and we don't want to commit violence because that is the way of the evil kingdom to be violent. We don't want to continue the violence in our thoughts, in our language, in our actions. We don't want to continue the violence. There is fortunately a third way and that is to keep the law but show its logical conclusion and how absurd it might be to be a part of that. In that moment, the lender, in the story that Jesus tells, the lender has an opportunity to repent. The lender has an opportunity to say, you know what, this is a stupid law. Why am I doing this to my brother? Why am I taking his coat? It's the only coat he has. Why am I doing this? The lender has an opportunity to see things differently. And that opportunity was served up to him by the person he had been lending to. The person didn't fight the system. The person didn't run away. But the person served up a picture of how the system was absurd. Now, I don't know if this has any meaning to you, I'm praying that you will think about it this week uh, uh, because I'm still thinking about it. I'm not done thinking about this because it's big. It's huge. It has a lot of, uh, here's a big word, it has a lot of ramifications. The, the ripples from understanding this, I think, go on for a very long time in our lives because they have, they have meaning for uh, uh, our relationships, they have meaning for our, uh, our jobs and our, uh, our way of life in Santa Clarita today. That's why I said it was hard for me to think about how to say this to you, but I've, I've said it the way that I have and I back it up with, by saying that, that the Holy Spirit promises that He will lead us if we will follow. He is the good shepherd. He is Jesus. He is God the Father. They're all one together and they have promised that they will lead us in this if we will follow. So he's not going to leave us comfortless. He's not going to leave us without direction. He doesn't leave us without a shepherd. In Psalm 24 it goes on, Psalm 23, 4 it goes on to say, because you are my shepherd, I am going to follow you. So I'm going to say today that that is my prayer for you as we finish up this prayer that as you say this prayer, whether it's part of your daily devotions or it's part of your Sabbath morning exercises and you say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That you'll be thinking about each of these major concepts that we've had over the last several weeks and that it ends up with, And Lord, please, Lead us. Sounds like a, a very definite decision has been made. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.